Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the another program. Today I want to uh, revisit the, the Cooper's Ferry uh, site because some more uh, confirmed dates have come out regarding the how old uh, the Cooper's Ferry site is. And they're suggesting that it is not only the oldest site confirmed by radiocarbon dating, Again, that's a very key thing to uh, understand there. It's the oldest site according to radiocarbon uh, dating now, which is uh, the oldest site in North America, rather, 16,000 to 17,000 years ago. Uh, obviously, other sites in which there are uh, a human activity that are way older in North America, and uh, the one that I'm talking about is the Cerruti Mastodon site in San Diego in Southern California. That site is around 130,000 years ago. Again, it's not a conf that's, that date is not confirmed by radiocarbon dating, but this site is. So uh, if you don't know what, Co uh, what Cooper's Ferry is, it's basically this site in Western Idaho. Let me pull up the map here. So you can see pinprick here. So it's within the uh, Snake River Valley of Western Idaho, which is a tributary to the Columbia River, which go empties out all the way into uh, the Pacific Ocean. Actually, I'm not sure if it empties into the Pacific Ocean or not. I don't know if it, I, I'm not sure if, if it flows east to west or west to east. Um, but anyway, you can get in and out through the mouth of the river there, which is again uh, on the border between Washington State and Oregon State here. Um, anyway, just to give you guys some context, the site that they're mentioning is the uh, Cooper's Ferry site because there's charcoal remains and tools and and all that stuff uh here's a here's a closer uh picture of it and if you can see the arrow here this is exactly where the site is again it it, it lies at the confluence of a few rivers here but um, um mainly it's along the salmon river and the valley there um some other sites are that are related is the Kennewick Man. They found the Kennewick Man near uh, Kennewick, uh, Washington, which is again along the Columbia River here. So let me just zoom in. It, again, this is uh, where the, the river breaks off into other uh, smaller yet pretty long rivers. And the Kennewick Man is dated to about 9,000 years ago. And he was, he's been a very, very uh, prominent discovery in terms of the history of uh, the archeological evidence of North America. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's some of the context there. I did an episode of maybe like eight or nine months ago regarding uh, the, the stemmed points here and how these tools, they found evidence of these tools all the way in Japan. So the last time I did, I, I mentioned this article, not this article, but the previous article regarding the, the pointing out the similarities between the, the tools of North, uh, Northern Japan and uh, Idaho. They were hypothesizing that the, the people in Hokkaido at the time, they just went all across. The, they, they basically, they didn't cross the Pacific Ocean as the crows flies, but they rather they hugged these uh, coastlines here. And the other peculiar thing was they found these stem points along the way. Uh, so that's very interesting as well. And But it wasn't confirmed until now that there is definitely a connection, especially with uh, them using a boating some sort of boating technology. And again, it, boating technology does sound like it's super advanced, and it is. In some ways, it is advanced, but it could have very well been just a raft. Thor Heyerdahl, uh, the, the, the famed um, adventurer, he actually went out and proved that you could, with a very rudimentary style uh, seafaring or coastline faring uh, vessel, he actually made the trip. And it took, I, I think it took like three months or something like that. It's a very famous story. If you guys don't know, you should just look up Thor Heyerdahl and that, that should come up immediately. So this site, again, is the key toward understanding, again, from a different angle, without even having to invoke anything from South America, that this site alone, the, the fact that it exists... Not to mention the bluefish caves in the Yukon or any of the uh, the other sites. It predates uh, Clovis for sure. So the Clovis again, this is another angle at which you can take that the uh, Clovis model gets destroyed. Uh, so anyway, let's move on to the article. So it's titled First People in the Americas Came by Sea: Ancient Tools Unearthed by Idaho River Suggest." Um, and again, this site in Western Hi Idaho, they found charcoal within the sediments that that insinuated that there were probably some sort of um, campfires going on and stuff. They, they were sharpened and shaped stone blades, again, uh, the, those stem points I was talking about. As contrasted with uh, the fluted points, 
uh, known uh, as the hallmark of the Clovis uh, Clovis people. At this pl place, they were butchering large mammals as well, which again, this Rudy Mastodon site is very interesting because the circumstantial evidence surrounding this Rudy Mastodon site is that they found these bones that had these marks that were no doubt left by humans just because of the way that um, they were butchering the animals. So 130,000 years ago, that's a long time. But if humans were doing that, then it's it's pretty amazing to see that they, they had been doing that all the way up until uh, this, this site, which is 16,000 years old, allegedly. And they were still doing uh, this type of butchering of, of these large animals. So again, that, that, that seems like uh, something, it's not direct evidence of anything, obviously, a lot can happen within a hundred thousand years but i think it's something to note and just to keep in your back pocket just as a reminder that hey that if they were butchering large animals sixteen thousand years ago why why does it not make sense that they were doing it a hundred thousand years before that so the cooper's ferry site is definitely at the very least sixteen thousand years old there's uh, another thing is um since cooper's ferry exists it adds a new layer of information, a new resolution, a sharper resolution of the picture of how humans first arrived by showing that people lived at Cooper's Ferry more than one millennium before the melting glaciers opened ice free corridor and then the Clovis first model, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, so for a thousand years at the very least, people were living there even though there was a huge uh, glacier that, that was occupying most of uh, North America here and there were still people living there. Um, and a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's too cold. They wouldn't have been able to live there. They must have lived closer to the equator. But that, that obviously isn't the case because, you know, people were starting fires and all that stuff. Um, they, they were healthy enough to, to hunt down huge animals and, and the like. Which, by the way, uh, if, if you're hunting a mastodon, that's enough meat to feed a village for, for a while. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of food. So this idea of overhunting the ma mammoths in, in the, into extinction within a few thousand years just, again, seems ridiculous. Uh, this implies that the first people in America must have come by sea, moving rapidly down the Pacific coast and up rivers. And again, um, if, you're, if you're coming down, let's just go through this path again. So if you're coming from, let's just say, northern uh, Japan again, you go along the coastlines... Um, obviously, the Bering Sea was not the Bering Sea. There was uh, it was Beringia at the time. It was a land bridge, so they go down. And so, if you're coming south from the north, one of the first left turns you you'd want to make would be on the uh, Columbia River, right? And if you're an intrepid explorer, you would definitely go down here, and it just keeps going and going and going until they made it all the way down to the Snake River Valley. So again, that this is one of the most uh, proposed routes out there because again, all this was ice. So they couldn't have gone in and traveled through the ice. The ice-free corridor wasn't there. So it must have been uh, down down uh, from the north uh, into here. And at the same time, there were people already living in South America who weren't part of this migration, but rather they came from Australasia, Melanesia, or around there. Uh, that's from genetic evidence. So again, um, that's the context of what's going on. Anyway, let's just continue. So is the site, Cooper's Ferry has been excavated for over 10 years, and they found all these spear points, blades, uh, tools called bifaces, which is basically like a hand axe, um, hundreds of pieces of debris from their manufacturers. So again, think about manufacturing, and then think about these sites it's very easy to imagine these sites as just like makeshift campgrounds, but they were, these were actually pretty, um, I think it's easier to imagine these as more permanent settlements because of a, their location. They're right next to fresh water. They're right next to the river. Uh, and B, uh, their menu It's a place where they're finding a lot of debris from manufacturing stuff. So, it's been thousands and thousands of years, and yet this st all this stuff still um, survives. So imagine how much they were making back then, and and the rate at which they were making. It's it, it's very interesting to see. Like maybe there's more to this than just these um, sparse campsites. Maybe it was more of a learning center or a manufacturing center that um, played a huge vital role in their in their community in their in their culture. 
Um, and also uh, getting to that level of manufacturing, again, takes a lot. It's not something that just uh, happens um, uh, haphazardly. It seems like that that um <clears throat> that those customs that, that those teachings that those skills must have been carried carried uh between from generation to generation for who knows how long and the reason why i think this more and more is is because of what i just stated but also um stuff tangentially related like oral traditions keeping those alive keeping um Human, their human history, their their people's culture alive from from prehistory, and that seemed a, a very prudent thing to do. So, if they're that concerned with keeping oral history alive, and I don't and I don't mean just these people who are living at Cooper's Ferry. I just mean uh, like any people that that have been studied through archaeology and all the people that I've covered in this channel, like Australasians, all these people. Um, then why wouldn't they preserve other parts of their culture as well, which would include technology and and um, uh, roles people play in the community and and all of these things? Uh, so yeah, that that uh, hundreds of pieces of debris from their manufacture just is such a uh, a more significant uh, find than you would you would uh, think at face value. Uh, most of the ancient bones belong to mammals, including extinct horses. And again, um, the, the the horses that were native to uh, North America at the time, along with a bunch of other megafauna, got wiped out after the Younger Dryas event. Um, if you haven't seen uh, my Younger Dryas video from yesterday, I highly recommend you you take a look at that because, um, especially if, if you want to know more about the Younger Dryas event, just because um, it's a, such a significant um a catastrophic event that it puts finds like these that are pre-Younger Dryas and pre-Clovis uh, into uh, a much uh, greater perspective and a much more impactful perspective for people who are just getting into this. Um, so they also found hearth and pits dug, uh, dug by the site's ancient residents and those also contain stone artifacts and more animal bones. Uh, the charcoal radiocarbon dates are 15,500 years old and then they've coincided that with uh tree ring records as well um and then they they recalibrated the data uh since the last time they revisited uh, cooper's ferry and they recalibrated it to about 16,500 to 15,280 um and it could be much older than that again this is just limited by all the evidence that they found at this one site there's probably other undiscovered sites or other sites that that have been discovered but need to be further excavated to really uh, uh, get a feel for uh, what not only what the snapshot of the population and 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 uh, human history was at the time, but also um, the extent of their of their stay of their settlement of the north of North America. And again, the further you deep, they haven't dug all the way down yet. Um, th there's a lot of uh, constraints there. There's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, you need more research. You need more accept. You need more people willing to spend the money on um, a further investigation. And there, there are a lot of roadblocks, uh, especially when it comes to uh, proposing uh, more funding for excavations and, and such. Because you got to convince a bunch of people who, you know, y who may not have as much expertise in the in the in the field as the archaeologists themselves. So there's a lot of red tape there, uh, but hopefully uh, they, they get a green light uh, to further uh, dig deeper because, you know, it's been 10 years of excavations and they found a, a bunch of stuff. So I think it warrants uh, more investigation. Um, there's another site in Texas called the Galt site, uh, and they dated that site about 16,000 years ago, but with optical luminescence, which is a little bit the dates are a little bit more erratic for optical luminescence um and that has uh endured its fair share of criticism but so has radio carbon dating as well so um it'd be interesting to see one uh at, at the galt site what they'll find in the coming years and you you should definitely stay tuned uh and and stay posted on that as well i encourage all you guys to just uh stay po st keep posted and and uh um uh, share the links and comments uh i have i've had a couple of people share some really interesting stuff uh in the comments over the past couple of days and um 
uh, I would love to talk about it more once I uh, do the radio program tomorrow. By the way, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific, you guys should check it out. Um, anyway, I'm bearing the lead here. So although the site is more than 500 kilometers from the coast, the Salmon, Snake, and Columbia Rivers link it to the sea. And as people come down the coast, the first left-hand turn to get south of the ice comes up the Columbia River Basin, and that is the left turn I was talking about here, right between Oregon and Washington State. So uh, the spear points uh, that they found are the stem points, which again are smaller, but much different than the Clovis points or the fluted points. They found these tools at early sites from British Columbia to Peru. So again, they found it all along the, the coast, the Pacific coast, all the way down to Peru, these sites. So again, there's there people who had that technology were passing through the length of the Pacific coast of both Americas. That's huge. That is a huge thing. And, and thousands of years before the Clovis people were, were allegedly there. Uh, similar points are known from Japan about 16,000, 13,000 years ago. Um, again, so they, they're about contemporary with each other. So that trip could have been made by one generation, just one intrepid group of people. Um, and they ma made their way all the way down. Um, he and other Davis and others argue that Western stem points are emerging as the best markers of the first people to arrive in the Americas. Um, again, there's, there should be an asterisk there because of the Australasian Melanesian signal in South America, but I get what he's saying. Um, pre Clovis for sure. Uh, there are plenty of sites in Siberia and R Russia without the technology. This is a, this is a, um, the, the flip side. This is the, cr the criticism here. There are sites in Siberia and Russia without the technology. And just look at how big Siberia and Russia is and think about how much excavation is going on. So, yeah, he's right, but that should be pending. I would think that they would, they would find more uh, sites with the technology. Um, but, um, again, uh, I, there was a comment from the last episode, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I end this here. Um, so it seems like there are these two different technologies, these stem points and the fluted points, uh, of the Clovis. So why, why was there such competing technology? And is it possible that they were contemporary with each other or, uh, or did the people just narrowly miss each other? The two populations, um, those are really good questions. And if the people who were using the, the fluted points, there was a theory that they came from the East. And because this, the fluted points are very similar to the Mousterian points that they find, uh, the Crow Magnon Man, which is essentially uh, humans living in um, uh, Europe, about twenty-eight thousand to thirty-one thousand years ago, around there, uh, just off the top of my head. So, if that theory holds up, then they <laughs> cross their own ocean from the east, but instead of the Pacific, it would be the Atlantic, and then those people came through. And then uh, perhaps they just narrowly missed each other before the Younger Dryas happened. Um, and then one group survived and the other didn't. Who knows? There's no, there's no real evidence for that. But I've heard a lot of uh, theories revolving around there. And um, there, there, there are currently a, a, uh, excavations and investigations going on to see if there is a connection between the, the, the Cro-Magnon points, the Mousterian techno technology, and um, the Clovis points. Uh, anyway, let me know what you guys think. Um, uh, please leave a comment. Tune in tomorrow uh, during the afternoon, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. on Grimerica FM. I have the link on uh, in the description, but also it's on the wallpaper or whatever the image I have for this. And um, yeah, leave a comment, uh, like, subscribe, share, and I'll talk to you guys later.